today's sermon title took uh, a lot of creativity. Uh, I spent quite a bit of time on it, as you can see. Uh, more from James Part 5. Kind of tells you who it's from. Uh, kind of tells you which one in the, in the series it is. And it's not less coming to you, it's more coming to you. So that's a good thing. But before I get into the next teaching of James, I feel the, the need to clarify something from last week. And that is in the area of confession and forgiveness. Specifically, the importance of confessing your sins before God. Some of you may have left with the impression I was promoting that born-again Christians need not confess or repent of their sins to God. I was not. I was attempting to explain that for the children of God, all of our sin, yesterday, today, and tomorrow's, has been atoned for, has been put under the blood of Christ and forgiven, and that God's eternal redemption of our souls does not hinge upon us asking for forgiveness for each and every sin that we commit. We can ask God to forgive us today. Incredibly, though, he already has. And he did so the moment we responded in faith to his call of grace. God's forgiveness of sin means this, that he has unconditionally and permanently pardoned us from the punishment that our sin deserves. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. You know, we read that, and yeah, but listen, have you ever meditated on that? Have you ever thought about that deeply? Now, it's important to understand, in light of that scripture, the punishment for our sins didn't just go away when we received God's grace. For example, God did not say, your sin is excused. Because God excuses no sin, not one. No, our sin, like every sin, still needed to be punished. Enter the Lamb of God. That punishment was transferred to Jesus. He took the punishment everyone but him deserved and crucified all of our sin. The wrath of God at that moment was justified. And satisfied. Why? Because the wages for sin is death, and that meant Christ's death has satisfied God's wrath. Everyone who, who responds to God's gift of grace by giving their lives over to him will never suffer the wrath of God. Why? Because Jesus already did for you and me. I was making the point that last week that many Christians are under the impression that unless they formally ask God to forgive them for each and every sin, that it won't be somehow forgiven. But the truth is, as I already said, he has forgiven it. However, sin in the life of a believer can still cause an estrangement in our relationship. Not that God walks away from us. No, never. But that we move spiritually away from him. Let's use this analogy. Let's say someone in your family sinned against you. Let's say it was your sister. Because she is in your family, your relationship is permanent. It's permanent because she was born into your family, born as your sister, so she will forever be your sister. Her birthright gives her that right. But because of her actions against you, there's a strain in your relationship. She seems to avoid you, or she acts embarrassed or odd when you're together. You still love her, she still loves you, but something in your relationship is a bit different now. So one day, she comes to you. She takes ownership of her actions. She acknowledges what she did wasn't right. She says she's sorry and asks you to forgive her transgression. And your reaction of love and your acknowledgement of forgiveness restores her. Not as your sister, for she was never out of the family. No, your restoration was needed to remind her that your love for her trumps any and all actions on her part. Here's a scripture. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born, not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. 
because we believed and we received in faith Christ as our Savior, we became members of God's eternal family. He gave us that right. Now, our post-salvation sin does not exclude us from the sonship or the daughtership that God has permanently granted us. We're not removed. Sin does not remove us from the family. Why? Because we have been born into the family. But there's a good chance that our sin has caused us embarrassment or shame, sorrow, or even guilt to the point we may even attempt to avoid one-on-one -on -one time with the Lord. Regardless, there can very easily be a strain in our relationship, not from God, not from His end, no, but from ours. Because in Hebrews, we're reminded, never, God says, will I leave you? Never will I forsake you. So what can be done then from our end? Well, David said this regarding his sin against his heavenly father. Psalm 32, David said, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. See, he allowed the embarrassment, his shame and guilt, and his sorrow from his sin to go unconfessed, and it escalated into something much worse. So what can we do? Well, here's what David did. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Confession cleanses, cleanses our conscience. Confession is like a balm of emotional and spiritual healing when we come before the Father after we've transgressed against Him and we've poured our, heart, our hearts out to Him, letting Him know just how sorry what we've done, right? I'm sorry, Dad. I'm sorry, Father. His response every single time, I know you are. Come here, my child. But if God knows our heart, and he knows we're sorry after we sin, then why do we need to say it? Do we need to confess and repent because God has a universe-sized ego that needs to be stroked? That would be no. You see, confession isn't for God's sake. Confession is for our sake. When we willfully sin, it signifies we have a temporary loss of consciousness of the depth of God's love and forgiveness in our momentary disobedience, our sense of peace became interrupted. So when we willfully conf confess our sins, it reawakens us to what Christ has done for us. See, we're reminded of our security in Him and our assurance of our salvation. Whenever we confess, we're reminded of just how much we are forgiven of our sins and that it is the blood of Jesus that cleanses us every single time from all unrighteousness. What a marvelous provision from God. What, what a depth of his, of his compassion and forgiveness is waiting for us every single time. When we confess our sins, our fellowship with the Lord is once again restored. Luke eleven four, 4, Father, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. This prayer, known as the Lord's Prayer, was a pattern for believers who had already been forgiven for their sins. Jesus speaks here of daily forgiveness, which restores any and all communication from God. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This does not mean that God is waiting for our confession so we can be saved all over again. <laughs> No, our confession is strictly for our benefit so we can continue on experience a cleansed and unhindered mind and heart. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. Believers then can and should continue to confess and pray daily for forgiveness, not with the despair of one who thinks he's been removed from the family, but in the confidence of one who is assured of his justification and adoption, an unconditionally loved child of God. Does that make sense? 
If not, have a meeting with Nick, Mark when he's back in here. They'll explain it more fully. Okay, so with that, let's get back to Pastor James and his next teaching. His teaching that continued to inspire and enlighten the young Christians of the first century as to what it looks like when you are a saved child of God. What does it look like to be a believer in Christ? Because there weren't a lot of them. There were a lot of other people who looked at these people as different. And so James is saying, if you are saved, if the blood of Christ has covered you, then here's how your life is going to look. So I ended up last week with temptation, where it comes from, and the actual step-by-step process it takes to develop into sin. And listen, if you need to, go back and listen to that, as Nick has said. You can go back and click on that. But two keys to remember from that teaching last week. Number one, we're all tempted continuously and relentlessly. And two, God never does the tempting. What will help immensely in overcoming temptation is our preparation for it. You see, when we know something is coming, we can take preemptive steps to guard against it. Look at Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You realize this this world has a pattern to it, a design, a very evil design, one that leads every human being away from God and never to him. And its method for carrying it out is, very simply, temptation. Temptation for all people is appealing to the flesh. I've never been tempted to jump out of an airplane or run a marathon, right? So it's not a problem for me because I don't want to do that in the flesh. But every temptation, see, the the flesh knows what your inclination is, what you want. Truly. But every temptation is appealing to our flesh, but it's appalling before our God. The truth is, no believer ever should be blindsided by temptation. As if the moment temptation appears, you're like caught off guard. Wow, where did that come from? Now, it came from the same place the vast majority of all temptation comes from. This carnal human flesh. James 1, 13 and 14. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he, is God tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Actually, you should be surprised when there's an absence of temptation in your life. Our preemptive steps to guard against falling into temptation should be by the Word of God. It's how Jesus fought it. You know, when we're in the Word daily, studying, meditating, fellowshipping, and praying, chances are we're going to be less vulnerable to temptation. Doesn't mean we're going to be tempted less. Jesus experienced all of our temptations. But when we're into the Word, we're studying, and we're praying, We're going to be less susceptible to the power of temptation. Trust me, temptation is powerful. Psalm 119. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. When there is ongoing communication between us and the Father, when the understanding of just how good God is and how unworthy we are to inherit all of these amazing blessings, when those are the things at the forefront of our thoughts, temptation will be nothing more than a passing thought, many times an unthinkable passing thought. Now, what will also help in refusing temptation, is remembering all that God truly has blessed us with. If you remember the story of Joseph, when Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him in Scripture, little doubt it was a great temptation 
for Joseph. Here's the report. Potiphar's wife. His master's wife said, come to bed with me. But he refused. My master has withheld nothing from me except you. How can I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Remember, in all he had been given, kept him in the right frame of mind to refuse the temptation. The point, the point that I'm attempting to make here is when we as the children of God have been so abundantly and continuously showered with the most gracious, valuable, and satisfying blessings our Father can bestow, how can we ever allow evil to gain a foothold in our life? James then goes on to implore his readers, don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. See, James here, in effect, is saying this. Quit blaming other people, your circumstances, and even Satan for your temptations and sins. Above all, never blame God. Realize that it's your fallen nature, your lusts, your weaknesses, your rationalizations that come from within. They have to be dealt with from within. James makes it abundantly clear that God's nature is incompatible with the nature of sin and that the only thing that does come from God is everything that is good. God's works will always reflect his character. From temptation to execution, God has zero responsibility for our sin. He does, however, hold all responsibility for every good and perfect gift that we receive. Keep in mind, Satan does not give gifts, and the reason is because we end up paying for anything that we receive from him. In this last scripture, now James calls God the father of the heavenly lights. This was an ancient Jewish title for God. It refers to him as creator, and as the giver of heavenly light, as in the sun and the moon and the stars. But unlike those created sources of light, as magnificent as they are, their light will continually shift, change, and eventually fade. God's character, power, wisdom, and love does not change, will never fade like unstable shadows. See, in the presence of God, there is no shadow. Here's what he says in Malachi 3, 6. I, the Lord, do not change. This was never made more evident in my life than this past week, tending to my sister's accident up in Detroit. My sister is a Jehovah's Witness, which means she's forbidden to receive transfusions or any blood whatsoever. The decision not to permit witnesses from receiving blood was handed down by one of their elders in 1945, citing Leviticus 17.10. Any Israelite or any alien living among them who eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut him off from my people. Obviously, anyone reading this who has godly discernment knows God was referring to ingesting and drinking the blood of animals, which pagans did at that time and continue to do today. God was warning his people against practicing what the Baal worshipers practiced, satanic in nature. So now from 1870, when the witnesses, their religion was established, and then for the next 75 years, they were permitted to receive transfusions as well as organ donations. Then all of a sudden, this elder heard from God and prophesied to man. God told him that he forbids his people from taking blood in any form. Eternal damnation will result, thus saith the Lord. Organ transplants and blood transfusions were totally acceptable for 75 years before the eyes of Jehovah. But then just like that, Jehovah decided they no longer were. 
But then in 1982, Jehovah changed his mind again and decided organ transplants were once again okay, but blood transfusions weren't. Shifting shadows. That was the law until 2000. Since 2000 until present, Jehovah has decided through the Watchtower Society that some minor fractions of blood are now allowed, but not whole blood. They refer to these changes as new light emerging from Jehovah. And what's, what's so difficult is that these wonderful, intelligent, beautiful, well-intended people have become deceived and hold to this doctrine in life or death. My prayer is that the true Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, will open the eyes of these incredibly deceived people so that my sister and others can receive the help that they so desperately need. It is absurd. I want to laugh how absurd it is if it weren't so incredibly tragic. My sister could die holding on to these false deceptions. You know, there were, when we were there, four of us went up, Katie, Jess, and Michelle and I. There were at times 30 people in the ICU waiting area surrounding the family for support. I assumed it was for support until I read one of their publications which directed witnesses to stay gathered around the family of someone needing blood to persuade them not to cave in. You see, their Watchtower publications hold for them the same authority as Scripture. This is what happens when you change, manipulate, and add to the Word of God. When you take God's word and adapt it to fit around your already established belief system, this religion is the only religion that wrote and published an entire version of the Bible based entirely around their already established system of belief. You see why it is so important for us to hold out and to hold onto the eternal, unchanging, perfect word of God in all its truth, regardless if we want to believe it or not. In all reality, this isn't much different from denominations and other groups of people who today want to strike out or ignore parts of the Bible because it disagrees with and even condemns their own personal beliefs. Hebrews 13.8. Jesus Christ, who, by the way, is the living word, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay, back to James 118. James writes, he chose, God did, to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Now, the word birth here refers to our spiritual regeneration not to creation. God says to us, because fallen's, fallen man's sin problem is internal, the solution to that problem must also be internal. There is no external rite. There's no external ritual, no ceremony, no action one can do to change his basic evil nature. We cannot, by acting righteously, become righteously. We can't, by thinking righteously, be righteous or talking righteously. As a matter of fact, there is nothing that we can do outside of receiving a new nature from God Almighty, a whole new inward being, that we can be made and be regenerated to God. We need to be recreated in holiness from the inside out, and only God can do that. Regeneration is his process, and he is very good at it. Regeneration is the act, and it's the act of God alone. It is accomplished in the exercise of his will, his sovereign will. God washes away sin, grants forgiveness, then plants new life, 
a new nature within each person who trusts in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. This is a miracle of unimaginable proportions, folks. Now, the next miracle of the same unimaginable proportions is that God takes up residency in our life. Look at John. I will ask the Father, Jesus said, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. On that day you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Can I get an amen? amen. Now this stems from God's promise to us six years, 600 years prior to this. In Ezekiel, it says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you. The moment that happens in a person's life, they are regenerated, given a new and eternal life by God. The Bible refers to those people, us, born-again believers, as being alive. Those who are not regenerated through Christ are referred to as those who are spiritually dead. And the only way life can be given to those who are spiritually dead is through regeneration by God. It's all God. It has to be. Now, those who are spiritually dead are totally unaware that they are. The dead have no awareness of sin. The dead have no awareness of what sin does. And they have no desire to turn from it. But even if they did, they would have no power to do so. Hear me now. Hear me now. Every one of us were spiritually dead at one time in our life. Ephesians 2.1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. This is believers now that he's addressing. And from Colossians, when you were dead in your sins... God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Listen, no child has ever been born into this world by his or her own will. The conception, the gestation, and the birth are completely out of their consciousness and control. The child is merely a passive recipient of the will and actions of his or her parents. No different from regeneration. No person can ever will for himself a new spiritual nature, much less create that nature by himself. John 6, 44. How it starts. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. If anyone desires to become a regenerated person to Almighty God, you can bet it's only because God has first drawn that person to him. If you are a regenerated child of God, then God had to first draw you. You. Why you? <laughs> because he so loves you. That's why. See, apart from God's revelation, we can't even know our need to be regenerated. I didn't know my need. Did you know your need to be regenerated at one time in your life? You were an enemy of God? Mm-mm. Listen, if a person thinks he needs a change in his life, then he grossly underestimates what he really needs and presumes that he can make this change all by himself. We find a lot of these people sitting every Sunday in churches all over the land, people who have made a conscious decision to become religious. Where they went to church wasn't all that important because it was mostly about an outward change. Maybe God did draw them, but they weren't ready to go all in. They merely put their toes in the water, they bought a Bible, joined a church, and hoped that that would cover their spiritual basis. 1 Corinthians 2.14, a man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. 
I believe regeneration to be the greatest miracle man could ever experience. It is, spiritually speaking, going literally from death to life. You realize our regeneration is greater than the Lazarus miracle, right? He went from physical death to temporary life. Regenerated Christians who have been given new birth have gone from eternal death to eternal life. <laughs> and although our, our regeneration is unrecognizable by the human eye, it is experienced in the human heart. And anyone who has been made spiritually new in the image of God, it should manifest itself outwardly by the way we live our lives. That's how others tell, which is once again the entire theme of James's letter. If you know Christ, if he is your Savior, if you have been saved by the blood, if you have gone from eternal death to eternal life, if that has happened to you, if the Spirit of God lives in you, then here is how your life will look. And the Bible calls this new birth being born again. I had a neighbor many years ago once try to tell me, you know, I heard that the actual words born again are not even in the Bible. Like, you showed it today, right? Not sure whose Bible she was reading, but it wasn't mine. And I quote, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Saying the song red letters, right? Those were red letters, or those are red letters in Scripture. Here's some more red letters. John 3, 7, you should not be surprised at my saying, Jesus says, you must be born again. As I conclude, so why are we given this new birth? Seems simple enough, right? I mean, eternal life for us. Yeah. Yeah. Right, awesome. But listen, that's only part of it. James says this. He chose to give us birth. God chose that. You didn't choose that. <laughs> Don't think you chose it. He chose to give it to us through the word of truth. Why? To merely just go to heaven one day? that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. For the Israelites, the first fruits were the first and best of the crops that they harvested. And they were also an indication of what the rest of the harvest was going to look like and taste like. See, a farmer would have been inclined to take this initial harvest and store it away just in case the rest of the harvest was lost to drought or locust, or some other calamity. However, the Lord required that it was to be the first and the best that was offered to him and to trust solely in him for the rest of their crops. It could be argued that the early believers were referred to as first fruits because they were to trust in the Lord. Once their lives were offered to God, there would come after them a harvest of many more believers. They were to give their very best for the Lord as witnesses, as models, as teachers, as living testimonies of what a life regenerated by God looks like. We may not be the same first fruits as these early Christians were. However, for those who will come after us, we just may be just as important as those first century saints were. See, we're to live our lives so attractively, so appealingly, that others who see us, others who come to know us, would be drawn to what we have. James's narrative to believers is people should be able to witness our regenerated lives and taste and see just how incredibly good the Lord is. Let's pray.
your word says to taste and see how good the Lord is. Lord, we have tasted. And we know. We could have testimony upon testimony from people in this room right now just how good you are, Lord. But Father, let us not forget about those who don't know how good you are, who are not of the understanding of their own sin, their own need to be regenerated to you. Lord, we pray for them. We pray for the eyes of the deceived to be open. We pray for the wisdom of God to call, to draw those who don't know you, Lord. We pray for you to call them and for the scales to fall so that they can see, so that they can taste truly how good you are. You've taken care of us, Lord, not just up to this point, but your promise is to us throughout eternity. You have, and we are truly thankful. I pray, Father, that as that temptation arises in our minds, that we are reminded by your spirit of all that you have given us, all that, that you have blessed us with, undeserving as it all is, and that that, Lord God, would help us to walk away from temptation. Bless each living soul here, Father God. For those that don't know you, I pray, Father, that they come to a saving knowledge. And let the others who, who can witness this, this beauty, witness just truly how good you are, Father, let us come before this world and demonstrate to them the love of God Almighty. We pray this now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me? As